Patrick Laine has officially exited player assistance, which means he can start talking to teams he wants to go to. Will it be the Jets or someone else? Let's talk about that on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. Doing so, of course, is always free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. Most of all, though, we just love and appreciate your support. Tonight's episode, we're going to kick off with uh, the official confirmation that Line A has exited player assistance. Uh, and look, I know you're probably tired of hearing about Line A, but a lot of us, let's be real, right? We will always hold a soft spot for him. And the more that you think about it, uh, the more it starts to seem realistic that he could actually come back to the Jets. Uh, I, I think that there are very real scenarios where he ends up in Winnipeg and they may not be that hard to pull off. I guess the biggest question is, you know, from Winnipeg's end, what do they have to give up? Because as it is right now, Line is a straight cap dump. So assuming that there's part of a larger framework for a bigger package here, do the Jets and Blue Jackets maybe exchange some disgruntled prospects? Do you see a, a you know, a Jiracek or something move to Winnipeg in exchange for McCrory? I don't know. Uh, Jiracek is obviously a player that I think they they likely have in their long-term plans, but they've also got a number of other deep prospects the Jets might be interested in. So it's not like they have to get Jiracek. Uh, there are guys like Kulamins who might also be really interesting uh, for Winnipeg's future blue line. But in terms of like this whole thing, right, uh, you know, I, I, I've thought about it, and I think that there are some real avenues where perhaps the Jets don't even really offer that much in terms of prospects, but maybe give up a little bit of salary uh, with some roster players or something that might actually help the Blue Jackets, because uh, if we're being honest, the Blue Jackets roster is pretty bad. So uh, there's a real chance that the Jets, when they cut salary, would actually give them a bit of a roster upgrade, which, I mean, that's marginal, but it is something to kind of talk about. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment, though, but before we go any further, just wanted to let you know that tonight's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, uh, create an account, and be sure to use promo code Locked On NHL for $20 off your first ticket purchase. Terms apply. Now, like I said, I've given this a lot of thought. Um, maybe too much, maybe not enough. I don't know. I've kind of come up with a number of different scenarios where I think the Jets could actually bring Patrick Line in. Uh, but, you know, first off, I think you have to move out salary. And the obvious candidates are are Alex Iafalo and, you know, Neil Pionk, right? I think those two contracts are, are relatively big. They're both expiring. Um, and for Winnipeg, you know, you're, you're looking at a player uh, that in this case – would definitely upgrade Winnipeg's top nine. I don't quite know where Line would play right off the bat. I know somebody said I was crazy. I think I referenced this in the previous episode, but they said I was crazy for uh, putting him with Lowry. But like, he's had a lot of time off, and he's only played around 45 to 50 games over the last couple of seasons. So uh, his game shape is probably going to be a little bit rough, and the time off, you know, for the past year or so is not going to have helped. But you know, I you know I, I suspect he's a real hard worker. I think off the ice he's been training a ton, and it seems like he's in a much better state all around. So, honestly, just on a personal level, I'm really happy for him. Whenever you see players go into player assistance, it means that they are probably dealing with something pretty serious. I know people like to make fun of um, the NHL's co cabin and stuff, but you know when you really think about why guys go into player assistance. Uh, for those who are really struggling and battling addiction, it is a dark, dark hole to get out of. Um, so I I'm just glad that it seems like Line, a, uh, you know, with his own personal struggles, not not substance related, but um, in terms of his own personal mental health, I'm just glad that he's seemingly turning a corner and that he's ready to uh, reintegrate and come back to the NHL. I know that the pressure and stuff and the constant buzz has probably been um, a little bit too much for him. And so I think the biggest thing for me is wherever he ends up, it's got to be in a quality, supportive, comfortable environment. And that's why 
stripping the Jets bias aside, I really feel like Winnipeg makes the most sense. Uh, if you ignore all the trade realities, all the caps and you know all the cap hits and everything, the simple truth is on on paper and and in terms of like a personality and and um, gosh relationship sort of thing, the Jets probably are the best place for him to end up. Uh, you have a fan base that still in many respects adores him. I know some of you aren't super uh, keen on him, but you know it is what it is, right? We all have our players. Uh, a lot of you probably like players that I'm not personally a fan of. And Line A is one of those guys who I'll always hold a soft spot for. And I think since you know going to Columbus, I think has changed a lot of his perspective and the way that he approaches the game. Um, but Patty, you know, I'll always remember the day that he was uh, – essentially drafted via uh, that lottery pick. When we won that pick, I, I couldn't believe it. It was a magical day, one of the best days. And like the cat or the, the Jets didn't really have like a lot to, uh, to to get excited about. So, you know, a season of trial and tribulation leading to line eight was like the light at the end of a very annoying and frustrating hallway. And man, Patrick, we all remember that first game against Toronto uh, with him in tow. It was just crazy right hat trick game winner you couldn't really author anything quite quite much more than that so um for for patty it's it's just nice to see him potentially coming back and i really feel like you know he's got his best friend here he's got a fan base that still loves him winnipeg itself he has said he doesn't mind living in uh and so if he's willing to come here for two seasons um i just i feel like everything kind of lines up for a return there's a new coaching staff there's a new player group it's very different than it was when he left. And I think he himself is different than when he left. He's not the same person he was when he departed for Dubois. Um, and so I, I feel like this could be a marriage that makes sense. And if the Jets want to do something like some low round, like picks and prospects, you know, maybe like C grade stuff. And then you send Ayafalo as part of the package and you get line A in exchange. Um, maybe there's something to that, right? Maybe you give up like a B prospect at, at most. I don't think the Jets really have to, uh, pay a ton through the nose, unless there's a ton of competition for Line A's signature, which, I mean, maybe there are some teams out there that are really desperate to bring in a big name, big potential scorer, and I could see that being the case. You know, Montreal has been interested, I, I think, for a while now. Uh, maybe Carolina is going to try to do something. Um, the Canes really don't have the cap space to do it, so they'd have to do some real restructuring, and I can't imagine that they're all that into that when they've got their own issues with Nietzsche's and related players, but in terms of, you know, finishing talent, right, that's definitely a thing that they probably could have used more of. And so, you know, teams like that who, who are really good but maybe lacking that extra finishing edge, if there's a way to retain the salary and maybe make the money work, I think a lot of squads would be interested. But all of this to say that there is considerable risk uh, that he is is going to struggle once he gets here um, or to whatever team he goes to, right? He's had a lengthy injury history. He's had a lot of time off, and his overall performance over the years has been like a roller coaster. So uh, there's no guarantee that he's going to hit the ground running and be that excellent player. But if there's a guy that I honestly would irrationally be willing to take a gamble on, more so than many other players, it'll always be Patrick, right? There's just something about him that's special. I, you know, I, I think more than just the shot, it's that cockiness, that confidence, um, the easygoing, cool manner, and uh, the way that he really did embrace the fan base when he was here. Uh, had things not ended the way that they did when he left, you know, I, I think we could have seen him become a real household name for the Jets fans, and maybe there's still a chance that he does. Uh, you know, he's still 26, which is not that old. Um, he has had a working number of injuries and I don't know what his game is like at this point, uh, especially with all this time off, but you know what, if he can make the money work and I think it's relatively easy and I, I think the jets can give up very modest assets, uh, in exchange, then I, I wouldn't be against it. Right. Uh, if there's one player I'd be totally comfortable with having come back after uh, a hiatus of sorts, it's probably Patrick. So we'll see how that shakes out. But, uh, you know, on that vein, you know, I, I saw some interesting comments uh, the day before yesterday or so about Winnipeg not necessarily having a 1C. And I think it's worth talking about what this roster's quality is at this stage, right? Is this team really up to snuff for a Stanley Cup contender? Where are they truly lacking? And is there a way to overcome that without having to have some of those players on your roster? We'll talk about that in just a quick moment, but before we go any further, thought it would be worth shouting out our friends and partners at Game Time. 
When it comes to buying tickets, a lot of you are probably used to getting hit with surprise fees, big charges. And when you're sitting down and you're at your computer and you're using a seat map, right? You pick a seat, you think you know where it is, and you have a rough idea. You can envision it maybe in your head. But if you've never been to a venue, right, you're not really sure what the view is actually like. Game time totally gets it. They know what it's like to spend hundreds of dollars on tickets and kind of go in a little bit blind. And they want to make it easier than ever. And best of all, they come with killer last minute deals, all in prices and views from your seat, all backed with their lowest price guarantee and event cancellation protection. It's why they've been an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. So, if you're like me and you want to take the guesswork out of buying tickets, whether it's to the Orioles or even to the Winnipeg Jets, or maybe some of you want those Taylor Swift tickets, well, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N H L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Hey, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you so much for rejoining us on tonight's episode as we're just chatting about, uh, you know, Winnipeg's competitive state and, and how all of this stuff is maybe going to affect it going forward. Obviously, lots of rumors around McCrory, Ehlers, Line A. Uh, I don't know how we're, we're back to all of these names somehow, but, you know, uh, the offseason, I, I guess, when you're bored and there's not a lot going on, well you find things to start to create drama out of. And uh, certainly with the Jets, there has been no shortage of interesting anecdotes and chaos over the last couple of years. But hey, you know what? Sometimes it leads to much better things. Just look at Gabriel Velarde. I think we can all say that that ended pretty happily. Now, I thought it would be worth talking about, you know, whether or not this team is really up to snuff for a competitive playoff team. And we'll talk about that in an, a, a quick second. But for all of you Fox Sports or ESPN watchers, if you find yourselves having to turn on the volume because there's too much shouting, you should make the switch to Locked On Sports today. A free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you daily to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. We all love that. Locked On Sports today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. All part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Now, returning to the Jets, like I said, uh, you know, I think there's a real um, disparity between, you know, how the Jets are built and how a lot of the top contending teams out there are built. But I, I kind of preface that by saying, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing for Winnipeg, right? Look, the Jets are never going to have like those McKinnon types for the most part, at least not yet. Uh, there are some prospects in Winnipeg system that have those kinds of ceilings, and maybe they turn into that eventually. But, you know, as of right now, we can confidently say that as it stands, the Jets do not have players of that caliber. What they do have, though, is a really well-balanced, very strong team uh, with lots of very good players. Maybe they're not best in the league. Maybe they would be second liners on other teams. But I think the biggest thing is that there are ways to make them play like the best players in the league. I think of lines like Ehler, Shifley, and Velarde that just dominated their minutes and masked some of the deficiencies. I think that's something that kind of gets um, a little bit overlooked when it comes to a team like Winnipeg or some of these other squads out there that also don't always have you know, the most elite talent. You have ways to get creative and combine groups that actually sort of compensate and make up for one another, right? You know, Ehler, Shifley, and Velarde individually might not be top liners on a lot of teams, but when they're together, they were just, I mean, an unholy terror. Uh, that line just killed its minutes. It didn't matter who they played. There were very few games where they were uh, bad and like at their worst, they were break even in expected goals and chances created. And like that was on a bad day. I think on a really good day and what you tend to see with them is that they control their shifts, they control the minutes and they make the other matchups for the bottom lines a lot easier, which is something that I think often also gets overlooked. Your top line should be controlling play. It should be setting the tempo and it should be softening those matchup minutes for your bottom three lines to get easier work. Uh, it's it's a huge difference maker for the Jets when they have a real top line. Winnipeg rules a great four-line squad that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with 
really just about anyone. And I think where Winnipeg is also really blessed is that when it comes to the guy in net, they have the best equalizer in the league. Connor Hellebuck can make a bad team look like a playoff squad. Uh, his ability to just consistently bail out teams is incredible. Now, you could argue the playoff record hasn't quite aligned yet, and I think that's fair. Um, I'm not going to hold this past playoff run against him. I don't think that was really his fault, but you, you might want to see his numbers tick up over the next couple of seasons because at this point, you know, he's getting towards the end of his prime. And I think for the Jets, there's probably a like an urgent feeling that they've got to start pushing for a real title here pretty soon. Probably not going to be the season, uh, if we're being honest. And we'll talk about what I'll define uh, as next year's success standards in a little bit. But for the moment, right, this Jets team, I, I continue to feel is like a higher end wild card squad. And I don't think that's insulting. I just think when you're talking about a lot of unknowns and, and new variables for the Jets, lots of rookies, um, some, some very new approaches with a brand new coaching staff. A lot of these guys haven't been with Winnipeg before. And, you know, with Arneal at the helm, we're going to find uh, a, a different approach perhaps than what we've seen with some of, you know, Paul Maurice and, and Rick Bonus's systems. I think Arneal has also, you know, tried to adopt a lot of the same things, but he'll want to put his own spin on it. He'll want to use more of the youth and skill and speed. And I am certainly all for that. So uh, I, I think that this year's team is, is good. I don't think it's going to be great. I think um, somebody, maybe it was Dom from the athletic had um, his model suggests the jets were a roughly 100 point team, which that's, pretty amazing uh for a team that's going through as many different roster changes as this one is you know winnipeg definitely lost a lot of talent but in my mind i think it's kind of addition through subtraction right this is not to say that defoley or monahan or, or or dylan were bad players far from it now you could argue that monahan and defoley really did struggle in the postseason but like dylan definitely a huge loss but for the jets What's kind of nice is that they've got a lot of young prospects who can probably do some really solid jobs and gain a lot of experience. I think that is one of the biggest things that Winnipeg will want to grow over the next year or two is this pool of experience for their kids. Um, they've got lots of young talent. A lot of it's untested, unproven, but extremely exciting. And for the Jets, getting that talent into full-time NHL roles that don't overwhelm them, that make them feel confident, and that let them adapt to the NHL game is really crucial. And so even if this team won't be able to stand against your Colorados or your Vegases uh, or even your Nashvilles, look, it is what it is, right? The Jets kind of have to go through some growing pains before they get to the promised land. Unless their turnaround happens almost overnight, I just think that the Jets have enough gaps and weaknesses to where you know, you'll notice it in, in pivotal moments in a series where maybe an extra goal or two would be the difference in, you know, a game three or a game four, uh, perhaps being the elimination game for in, in game four versus, you know, having to go all the way to game seven or in Winnipeg's case being out in five, right? Uh, I think that there's some real narrow margins for the Jets to have to thread. And that is where that five to 10% better on your roster probably becomes really noticeable. And, you know, for Winnipeg, uh, they've always been one of those teams that sort of hovered in that, you know, quality middle of the pack. But I will say, I think they have a bright future uh, based on the players that they've drafted and, and sort of the approach that they're starting to take. There's stuff there that makes me think, you know, the future is going to be brighter for this team. But as it is right now, you know, you've, you've got Mark Shifley, who's arguably a 2C on like an elite contender. Um, you've got lots of players who are maybe elevated to bigger roles with the Jets than they would be elsewhere. Uh, Dylan DeMello kind of comes to mind. I love DeMello. He's been awesome for us. But on like a true top end contender, he's probably a second or third pairing blue liner. So that really speaks to where the Jets have had to elevate a lot of names that don't traditionally uh, fit into the role of, of top end player. And, you know, Maybe that's a sign of where the Jets are as a franchise and as an organization. But you know what? Sometimes you can still make lemonade out of moldy lemons. And the Jets don't really have many moldy lemons. They're sitting pretty. I think that they have a very intriguing crop of youngsters that are going to join this team. And I really want to see how this year goes. Um, I am semi-excited about it. I, I think I'm looking forward to some real change in progress because I think 
you know, despite bonus coming in and, and really adjusting the culture, the on ice stuff didn't always change as much as you'd expect. Defensively, yes. Offensively, maybe a little more questionable. But if Arneal really is the guy to take this franchise forward, let's hit the ground running. Now, I did say earlier I wanted to talk about what I would define as success for this upcoming season, and uh, I've got two to three criteria that I think really fit this bill. Before we talk about that specifically, though, just wanted to shout out our friends and partners at FanDuel. I love sports, and I love them so much that I wish they never ended, but, you know, the NHL season's over. We've got about, you know, 75, 80 days till the start of the next season, and, you know, the Olympics may be going on, but it feels like it hasn't really been promoted that much. And so, you know, you're probably left with baseball. Maybe you're watching some uh, preseason stuff for other sports. Maybe you're reading social media or, in your case, listening to my podcast. But you're still wanting just a little bit more sports action. FanDuel totally gets it, and they want to help you keep the sports going whenever you want. All you have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood. This summer, FanDuel is also hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Sure, head on over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Hey friends, and welcome back to these closing thoughts on tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you so much for rejoining us on tonight's episode as we're just wrapping up uh, with some final thoughts um, on, on Winnipeg's kind of like their offseason, sort of their approach. And I, I want to sort of look ahead to next season, right? What would qualify as a successful year? I think this is a very ambiguous question. Um, in part because everyone's going to have a different definition of what they think success is. I've had people say that if the Jets don't make the playoffs next season, that it is time to fire Shovel Day off, which I find interesting because, um, you know, uh, if I'm being honest, you know, I I, I, I I, mean, the team hasn't been as successful as it should be. I get it. I understand the frustration. I can see why a lot of people would feel like, this team should have been better. But if you're asking me personally, I, I'm not expecting this team to really be a playoff contender next year. Uh, I, I think I've sort of, you know, to some degree measured my expectations. I think Winnipeg is going to take a bit of a step back and I'm not upset about that. Uh, I've, I think, you know, for me, when we're talking about success for next season, right? The first big thing that I want this team to really do is truly embrace uh, the the future, right? This is where Lambert, Chibrikov, uh, Heinola, or uh, Heinola, you know, these guys um, really are are pivotal pieces for Winnipeg's uh, present and future. And uh, you know, I I just I really feel like um, you know if you've got guys like Heinola and a, and a few others anchoring your, your bottom pairings as they start to gain experience and Lambert and Chubrakov are being integrated and gaining NHL experience, figuring out gapping NHL timing, those reads, that stuff is, is crucial. And it's not something that you can just teach players. They have to experience it and gain it firsthand. And that's why this season, if they really develop and take big steps forward in their pro careers, I would consider that a big success because those players are going to be guys that you build around going forward. Um, Hainala obviously hasn't always had a uh, you know the best showings at the NHL level, but I think recently he's looked really strong. And had he not broken his ankle last year, we wouldn't be in this particular position. We'd probably already be talking about him uh, entering Winnipeg's top four or something. So um, hopefully Hainala uh, stays healthy this year. Um, as for Lambert and Shibrikov, you know I think you know Shibrikov probably less so, but I think, I think Lambert's going to be one of those guys that's fighting for a Calder. I think Shibrikov could be in the conversation, but much more distant. Lambert is the guy that I've pegged to be one of the hottest rookies in this year's crop. And I'm very excited to see what he can do. Uh, if Celebrini really hits it off, I, you know, I can't really imagine that anyone's going to stop him, but uh, for me, you know, it is what it is. I think Lambert's been killing it at the AHL level. Uh, he's put up some really big numbers, and so it wouldn't shock me if he is at least in the finalist conversation for the Calder in this upcoming season. The second uh, the second thing that I would say I would qualify as success is if the Jets start playing more aggressive, higher-paced, skilled hockey. 
if Arneal is able to start implementing these systems the way that he has preached, I think that would be a huge success, right? And if they start to dominate and control play at 5v5 without just relying on a strong defensive structure, I think I would call that a success. You instill a real aggressive, offensively oriented mindset with this team, one that favors speed, skill, and um, that extra level of, of playmaking ability that perhaps the Jets haven't always had, then you know what? Even if the Jets narrowly miss the playoffs or get eliminated early, I would say that's still a win, right? If you instill the right habits, if you play the right way, then I can accept results where you don't always get the way uh, or get what you want, right? If the Jets are playing hockey the right way, then you know what? If they lose, they lose. What I want them to do is still play uh, the the way that will eventually lead them to playoff success. Sometimes you just have to trust the process and stick with it. And I know it's a very overrated phrase, but I think for Winnipeg, it's going to become truer and truer as they start to graduate more and more prospects to the NHL level. That is your big goal. That's your pipeline. And it's how you're going to build out this team from the ground up. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid to stumble here and there, but learn from your mistakes and continue to gain that experience. It sort of folds in with, you know, point number one, but point number two, like I said, if the coaching staff gets this team playing the right way, I can accept it. Now, this third one is kind of more of an optional criteria. If the Jets make the playoffs, then I would really like them to win a round. Uh, last year's playoffs uh, run was pretty disappointing, and the Jets did pay a fair decent amount for Monaghan and to Foley. Not a ton, mind you, just a couple of assets that, you know, I, I would say, comparatively speaking, were more expendable. The Jets still did enough to get, you know, that second rounder out of Mon or out of uh, L.A., you know, the, the Montreal second rounder. So it's not like Winnipeg was completely lost for assets. And the second rounder that they did give up for Toffoli is this upcoming season's one. So that ain't too bad at all. But um, for Winnipeg, I, I think it'd be nice if they can uh, at least get through the first round. Right. You know. Matching up against the Avs, it was a bit of a nightmare scenario. I think it was one of the worst teams that they could have faced in round one. I don't know what the upcoming season is going to be like, and I have a hard time really predicting how the uh, opening rounds are going to be, especially if the Jets are stuck in a wild card, which is entirely possible. So, um, you know, for Winnipeg, the main thing is grow your team's experience and skill and style of play. Everything that comes after will naturally follow, whether it's a playoff spot, a near miss, or maybe even a deeper run. But you start playing the right way, you start instilling the right habits, you get those special teams back on track, and you get that power play looking like it's a real power play and hopefully a penalty kill that doesn't kill penalties by just conceding goals. I, I think that would make me a lot more hopeful for the subsequent seasons. There are still a ton of questions with the roster. I, I still have a lot of uncertainty about how this team's going to look, but I think at the very minimum, if you can be fun to watch and make, you know, the Jets fans really care about this team again in a way like they did with this past season with Bones, uh, I, I think you're going to have a successful year. I don't have to have the playoffs. You know, I don't I know the Jets probably would disagree because there's a big financial thing. But the main thing is get your kids the experience they need and start to see this next crop, because I really feel like the Jets are poised for takeoff, but it's going to take some nurturing and patience. Let me know what you would qualify as success for the season, though. Maybe you are very one of those uh, hardline people who's like playoffs or nothing. And, you know, I would actually completely understand it, especially for you season ticket holders. It's a lot of money you've poured into this team and you're tired of waiting for the Jets to get better. So let me know below what you're feeling, but drop your thoughts and comments below or at my social medias at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thank you so much for listening and making Locked on Jets your first listen of the day every day. We will see you back here next week with more Jets coverage. Uh, and also just a programming note, as we head into August, we will be down to three episodes a week. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, we will still be daily until that starts. But like I said, that's all the time we've got for tonight. As always, thank you so much for listening and making us your first listen of the day. We'll see you back here soon enough. Have a great night. And as always, go Jets go.